diagram that I have on the board behind me is probably one that looks very, very familiar to you because it's one that we talked about um, back in chapter two when we first started talking about matter. We said that matter is divided into two categories, either pure substances or mixtures. And then we broke pure substances down into elements and compounds. And then we spent a lot of time in chapter three talking about atoms, which is, goes under elements. We spent time in chapter four talking about the periodic table, which is how all of your, your atoms and elements are organized. And then in chapter five, we started talking about, about compounds because we talked about bonding and how I take the elements together and bond them into compounds. So that was chapter five. Um, and then um, we skipped chapter six. Chapter seven was on chemical reactions. And so that was a combination of elements and compounds. And chapter eight was on nuclear chemistry, which talked about how one element could turn into a different element of based simply on a nuclear reaction and, and how the, the number of protons in the center of the atom and the nucleus of the atom could change. So basically everything that we've done in the chemistry part of our physical science course so far has been about pure substances and elements and compounds and reactions and things like that. So now for the last two chapters of this course, we're going to switch to the other side of this diagram, which is on mixtures. And you'll probably recall that we did at least define the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. Um, homogeneous mixtures, we said, had a very uniform appearance, while heterogeneous mixtures were ones that you've got different things mixed together, but it doesn't look the same all the way through. And we mentioned that trail mix is a really good example of a heterogeneous mixture. Um, you can see the cashews and the peanuts and the M&Ms and the raisins and whatever else may be in that particular trail mix. You can see all of those different pieces in the mixture. You can separate them out. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about um, in this chapter is both homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. Today, we're specifically going to concentrate on heterogeneous mixtures and how those can be broken down. Um, so like I said, heterogeneous mixtures, hetero means different, and so hetero means that you can actually see the different parts of the mixture like in a trail mix. Now we're going to take that and we're going to actually break it down into two different types of heterogeneous mixtures. The first type is called a suspension, and the second type is called a colloid. And a suspension is a type of heterogeneous mixture where you have a fluid. So like, uh, remember that's either a, um, a liquid or a gas. So you have some sort of a fluid and you have particles mixed into that. And if you leave the suspension sit long enough, the particles are going to settle out. So they're gonna fall to the bottom. And your book gives you um, a number of different examples of this. Um, you can have a liquid suspended in a gas. And so an example of that would be like a cooking spray where you have um, particles of maybe canola oil suspended in air. And so when you use your aerosol can and you spray your cookie sheet or you spray your baking dish so that your food won't stick to it, what you see happen is that when it comes out, it's a suspension, but once it hits the dish, then all you see there is the oil. So the oil has settled out of the air that it was suspended in. Um, another example of that, uh, of a suspension is you can have a gas suspended in a liquid, such as when you have foam on top of your root beer or fizz on top of your soda. Um, eventually, if you let it sit there, um, the gas all escapes and you're left behind um, with, with the liquid. Um, another example of a solid suspended in a liquid is if you have mud. And so if you um, come tracking in the house with your muddy shoes on, I mean, obviously the fact that you're first gonna get in trouble probably, but if the mud sits there and you don't clean it up right away, what will eventually happen is the mud particles will kind of settle to the bottom and you'll be left with water on the top and then the water will evaporate off and you're left with these muddy footprints all over the floor. 
Okay, so mud is a suspension because the dirt will settle out of the water. Um, another example um, of a solid suspended in a gas would be airborne dust. Um, if you've got bright sunlight coming in a window, sometimes you can see the dust particles kind of flying around in the air. And we all know if your mom ever asks you to, to, to dust, uh, and then you have to take a rag and you have to wipe the dust off the shelves and uh, maybe the top of the TV or the top of the computer, the top of your tables, you wipe all that dust off because the dust which had been suspended in the air eventually settles out and then it collects on all your tabletops and you gotta clean it all off. Um, an example of a liquid suspended in a liquid is if you have oil and vinegar salad dressing. Um, with those types of salad dressings, you normally have to take them and you have to shake them up so that they're mixed together so that you don't, the oil will float on the top because we learned about that when we learned about densities. So if you don't shake it up, you're gonna end up with all oil on your salad dressing in place of um, oil and vinegar and that wouldn't taste very good. So you shake them up to mix them together. If you leave it sit, then they're gonna separate. They're gonna settle out. Okay, so a suspension is when you have a fluid and you've got particles that will settle out of it. If you have a colloid, th those are particles that are, that are too little to settle out. Particles that are too small. Whoops, that's two, she only have one O. To settle out. Particles that are too small to settle out. Now your book has a lot of really good examples um, in it of different types of colloids, but the thing that, that you can really tell the difference between um, something that's a colloid and something that is not is by using the Tyndall effect. And believe it or not, you've actually done this once already. The Tyndall effect is if you take a laser or some other type of a light and you shine it through a colloid and what you can see is you can actually see the beam passing through that, that colloid. We did this um, back in chapter 22 when we did the refraction lab. And I told you to take a, a pan, uh, a glass pan and put water in it and then just put a few drops of milk into it. And then you took a flashlight and you shone it through that so that you could see how that light ray was gonna bend as it passed through the glass, through the water, back through the glass and back out into the air again. Okay, so there in that particular example, you used a flashlight beam because if you look down into the water that's got milk in it, you can see exactly where that beam is passing through. And so milk put into water, and once you mix it up, it's a colloid. That milk's not gonna settle back out again. And so if you check your book, you will see um, several other examples of colloids. They give you some really good examples there. Um, they will not settle out. One thing I do wanna mention though is paint because that one might confuse you a little bit. Um, if you've ever painted before, you know that you always have to take the paint and you have to shape the container up really good before you actually start using it. Um, it is true that some of the larger particles in the paint will settle, but all of it will not settle out, and so that's why it's classified as a colloid. I have also given you a link to another video where a gentleman is demonstrating um, the Tyndall effect, so make sure that you watch that because he does a really good job of showing you how those light beams pass through colloids and how they don't pass through other things. Okay, so that is heterogeneous mixtures.